Good evening and welcome to Galesburg Nazarene. This is our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. I'm Judy and, and uh, we welcome you at home who are watching whenever this is posted. Uh, you're always welcome to check out the website for other activities and services that we do here. But I also appreciate those who come on Wednesday night and uh, give a little personal interaction here. We've been going through the churches and, and the book of Revelation and uh, I have enjoyed this. Uh, tonight we're going to do the church in Philadelphia. And uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us, for the word of God. Lord, we thank you that you give it as a lamp into our feet, that we know where we're going as we trust in you. We may not always know the answers, but Lord, we know that you provide them when we need them. So tonight I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds to the truth that you have for us. I pray that we would be obedient to what you teach us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going through the seven churches. Uh, tonight's Philadelphia. Next week is going to be the church at Laodicea. Um, and I think as a person that's been in the church my whole life, uh, I've heard so many sermons about the Laodicean church because they were lukewarm. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about Philadelphia tonight. So we're going to talk about Philadelphia tonight, Laodicea next week, and then the following week we're going to do kind of a summary wrap-up of all the churches. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, and I, I pray that you read your scripture ahead of time and ask God to help you. Um, I also want to tell you that, you know, please do not, you know, I have about 30 minutes to do this. Um, sometimes a little bit more. I can't tell you everything that is here, and I try to prioritize and, and, and share what, it, what is here. And I also try to not necessarily repeat what maybe someone else has said, but just to kind of look at this. And so um, just uh, keep that in mind. That this is not an all-inclusive uh, summary of what the truth that God shared to the church in Philadelphia but let's look at some history first because I think it helps us understand a little bit about where we are when we talk to uh, God talks and Jesus speaks to, this, um, to us about who they were in their community. The, the town of Philadelphia did derive its name from a, a person, Adelus Philadelphus, uh, the king of Pergamos who died about uh, 138 B.C., um, the town was situated on the slopes of Mount Tmolus in a fertile area for grapevines. And on the coins of the town are to be found the head of Bacchus, the noted god of wine. And if you've kind of picked up a theme here, um, a lot of uh, worship of idols. Uh, Bacchus was known for his, uh, for lack of a better word, debauchery and, you know, drunken behavior. Uh, the town was built high on the ground, upwards of 90, 900 feet above the sea level. But the whole region was volcanic, uh, and a few cities, uh, there's not many cities that suffered as much as Philadelphia did when it came from earthquakes. So there was a lot of reoccurrence of that, and um, a lot of the, obviously, the architecture and the housing suffered. Um, they lost a lot of population because of, it was... Um, not necessarily a reliable place to live, uh, but it was had very fertile soil, so you kind of pick your battles. Am I going to live in a rubble home and have good soil? Um, so there were, probably wasn't a large population. Um, but of all the seven churches, uh, it had the longest life of a Christian city. And it's not as old as some of the other cities in Asia Minor, uh, it was founded on uh, one of the highways that led to the interior. It also had another name called Decapolis uh, because it was considered one of the ten cities of the plain. And I, I thought that was interesting. Uh, we have ten cities of the plain. It was noted that in history. Um, but we only have seven cities of the plain being talked about in the book of Revelation. Uh, we also know there's another city that wasn't addressed uh, Paul wrote a letter to him, the Colossians. And so we know that there was a church there. So we don't know why that not all the churches in that area were addressed. Uh, we've talked about the number seven before. Uh, but we have to trust that these seven churches that Jesus brought out had a very significant purpose 
they were a unique mix of strengths and weaknesses that would apply to all of us through the ages because they do bring out in every portion of scripture that is addressed to the church. If anyone has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So let's look at the portion of scripture. Uh, we're looking at Revelations 3, 7 through 13, starting in verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. You have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of my city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I must begin by saying that the name of the community, even though it is named after a person, is still an indication of what's happening in this church. Philia is one of the words for love in Greek, the Greek language meaning brotherly love. Now, this church was in brotherly love. Now, it doesn't say that here. Names are important, and I would like to think that this church body was filled with love for each other. It received no criticism from Jesus, and we also know that other churches were admonished for forgetting their first love. We conclude that this church was with brotherly love, just simply by the name. And when we go into Hebrew, and especially the Hebrew nation and, and the Jewish tradition, names were very important. And so any time that there is a name, it's going, to, it's going to carry a weight of meaning. Now Jesus is talking, and he describes himself as holy and true. Now these words mean, and it's interesting that the pastor talked about this Sunday morning. He talked about being set apart. Um, holy is something that you are set apart for service. And this word holy here means set apart as holy. Him who was not only consecrated, but holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And literally made of truth. I like that. He is holy and true. He is literally made of truth. That is what his components are, holy and true. Jesus is the true steward of the house of David. Now, we might not necessarily understand what steward means, but the keeper. uh, Jesus was the absolute right of sovereignty. He had that right to be sovereign over the house of David. He was the rightful political heir to the throne of David. If David's throne had continued and they had had a political kingdom that was passed down, Jesus would have been crowned the succeeding king when he was born. A lot of people don't realize that Jesus came to be the king of kings and lord of lords, but when you looked at the, look at the lineage of Jesus, and obviously in the Bible they do it from two different directions, Joseph and Mary, Jesus would have been the rightful political king for the Israelites. He did not exercise that political right on his earthly ministry, but there will be a day when he will do that. His death, though, and if you think about it, the the disciples were always trying to get him to take the throne because they understood that. But Jesus wanted to establish the spiritual throne. Uh, He did establish his sovereignty over the spiritual kingdom of people. But I wanted to go back, because as I was thinking about this, the sovereignty 
the sovereignty started with Abraham. And if you think about Abraham, well, he started out as Abram. Abraham was not a Jewish person, but he loved God, and God chose him. Genesis twenty-two eighteen. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So here we have Abraham who obeyed God. God blessed him, and through him, all the offspring of the earth will be blessed. Then that blessing was directly applied to David and his throne. Second Samuel 11b through 13 and verse 17. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. They're prophesying about Jesus right here. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So what started with Abraham being chosen out of people because he obeyed God and walked in fellowship with God was came to a head in David. And so when we look at this and says that it says that Jesus is the true steward of the house of David, we have that lineage, we have that direct beginning part, that human element to come through this. Um God chose imperfect people. We know that Abraham was not perfect. We know that David was not perfect. But he chose to to choose these people, and he dedicated this king, David, to bear the throne of the coming Christ. God uses imperfect people to accomplish his salvation for all mankind. And we've talked about before how Jesus was that perfect God man mix. He was perfectly God and he was perfectly man. So we not only have Jesus coming as God, establishing that spiritual throne, but he has every right to claim that human throne too. Now, this next portion of scripture is the back end of uh, verse 7 and into verse 8. And Probably one of the most fascinating verses that I find, you may find it, whatever, is when we talk about these open and shut doors. Let me read it. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. The he here is none other than Jesus Christ. He has placed this open door. Um, and that throne in his, uh, uh, but God created a human kingdom through the person of David, and Jesus was the rightful heir for that throne in his earthly body. But because he was fully God too, he was able to perfect his role as king, not just in the flesh, but in the spirit. And think about it. This gave him magnificent authority to create an open door to the Father. Think about that. This open door in the Old Testament, they had to they had to separate themselves and and cleanse themselves, and and they could only go in once a year. But Jesus created this open door through His death and resurrection. He sits on the throne in heaven. So a lot of times we talk about we we serve a, a, a Savior that died, we serve a Savior that rose again, but we also serve a Savior who sits on the throne at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And I like what this verse says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And this is Daniel looking forward to the role that Jesus is going to play in the future. He, being Jesus, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So this perfection thing that Jesus came in the flesh, fulfilled all the law, died, rose and lived again, and because he was fully God and fully man, he created this open door. 
And in John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 10, 9, I am the gate or door. That word gate there is translated door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. So that door, that gate is the same door, that same word that Jesus is using in the book of Revelation. I am the door. I am pr providing you an open door to the Philadelphians. Jesus is this door. He is the open door for the Philadelphia people. The concept of an open door, open and closed doors is fairly common, and we often hear this phrase, well, you know, if God closes a door, he's going to open a window. And that's very simplistic, and maybe it is true. But if we think about God's power and sovereignty in that basic way, we are missing a great blessing in understanding how God works and how to direct our faith. First of all, earthly kingdoms will fail and they will fall. History alone teaches this. There is no country that has not fallen. We might think that we have it all together, whatever we have, whatever nation is going on now, but history teaches us that even the great Roman Empire fell. But God's throne is forever. And if we read the entire book of Revelation, we know that Jesus himself will lead the charge to take this earth back from all evil. He will be the battle leader. And he is the rightful king of kings and lord of lords, not just of the Jewish people, but of all mankind because of that promise back to Abraham that all nations on earth will be blessed because of Abraham's obedience to God. So if we believe in the powerful and permanent sovereignty of Jesus, then this bolsters our faith in tough times. I would assume it bolstered the Philadelphians. Jesus says, I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door. I know what you have accomplished, and I will make a way for you to continue to accomplish all that I want for you to do. Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Remember, remember though, this isn't our plans, but God's. And a lot of times we want to people think about this verse, if God is for us, who can be against us? It's not what we're planning or what we're doing. But when we go through the open door that Jesus has established for us, there is nothing that can stop us from accomplishing what God wants to do in our life. We open that door, and Jesus, Jesus told Peter that upon this rock, the church, the gates of hell will not prevail. So as we go before that door, there is no one can deter, stop, thwart, or prevent. And that's absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing when we have ourselves aligned to what God wants us to do. There is nothing that the world can stop. But because it is God working in us and through us, and he clears a path for us, we just need to walk with him. Next, it says, I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet, excuse me, and acknowledge that I have loved you. Now, what Jesus says here, I know that you have little strength. Now, that word in the Greek is actually means I know you have little power. Uh, some have indicated that they may have had an intense battle or, or, or issue that has depleted their energy or their stamina. Other claims is somewhat of an admonition to gain strength. We don't know. But Jesus, the keeper, the key of David, is telling them of the open door. He is saying, you don't need strength to go through this to pursue this opportunity. He provides the strength. And I'm not necessarily agreeing that this is an admonition for them. Because in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he says, But he, God said to me, said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So given this verse from Paul, it would seem that the little power in the Philadelphians had was not a problem, but rather our point served so that they, they would need God and rely upon God, but that God's strength would fulfill and bring glory to him. 
so that the strength would not, they would not rely on their own strength, but on God's. Now, we also see another reference to the synagogue of Satan, which we heard before. Those claiming to be Jews, but serving the devil, and Jesus is emphatic here. They are liars. He doesn't mince words here. Remember, Jesus made the same accusation toward the Jewish leaders during his earthly ministry. They rejected him as Christ, and no doubt Satan was using other Christ deniers that made that same accusation toward other Christian followers, we just, which leads us to another thought. We don't know why that they were weary or had little strength, but it's possible that the great trial that they were accused of great trial that they were participating in, that they were accused by those of the Jewish synagogue and were brought before the courts to renounce Christ's name and possibly paid homage to the Roman leader. Now, this was a common practice back then. Uh, and if they did not, they received punishment or fine. Now, just think about it. it. You know, we see this in the book of Daniel where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel didn't bow down to their, their earthly rulers. That was pretty common back then because they served these idols. And so they, uh, a lot of times the, the leaders of the country took on this uh, idol persona like, well, you know, I'm the, I'm the God and you have to worship me. And so these uh, people of the synagogue of Satan said, well, you know, they're, they're putting their trust in Christ. They're not putting their trust in you. So it's very possible that this could be some of the things that they endured there. But we know from what Jesus just said here, the church did not renounce the name of Jesus. Jesus was also going to provide for them an opportunity where those lying about them will be forced to honor them as they loved God. Now, we do not know or when that will happen or how that happened, but there is a verse in Proverbs that says, a person makes his plans, but God determines his steps. And we know at some point, those who harassed these people were humbled and required to acknowledge these Philadelphian church members, that they were loved by God. So what I took away from that is that God knows that he will take care of us in our heavenly home. We will receive the reward for not denying Jesus' name. But he's also saying that there's going to be some checks and balances here on earth. Yet remember, this is God's determination and not ours. It's not like, you know, I don't think we could say to God, well, you know, so-and-so is bad-mouthing me. You know, I think at some point in time they need to come and eat humble pie. That's not what it's saying here. But it is saying we know that these people had gone through a trial. We know that God knew that that, that was hard for them. And God said, you know, there's going to be a time where they're going to have to honor you. Now, that may not always be the answer to our problems, but what it says to me is that God cares. There's not always going to be bad stuff here. There's going to be times where God does take care of us in an earthly way and not just when we get to the heavenly gates. Verse 10 says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. And I do like what this one commentator, his name's McLaren, wrote about enduring patiently. This patience has in it the idea of perseverance as well as endurance. Not only that we bow to the pain or to the sorrow, but that nothing in sorrow, nothing in trial, nothing in temptation, nothing in antagonism has the smallest power to divert us from doing what we know to do what is right. You know, I don't think any of us likes pain or suffering. And if we had a choice, I think we would all live life without difficulty. But there is a calm that can happen when we totally rely on God during those times. And it comes from surrendering to the situation and knowing that God will sustain, sustain us through a difficulty. Our patience, endurance gives praise to God. And you know, I was thinking about, I have a person that I work with and his wife is due any second. And it always takes me back to those days when I had my children and how difficult labor is. It's hard. But one of the things you learn, and they teach you in childbearing classes, is that when you're going through labor, if you, you've, you've got you've to calm yourself down and you've got to be at peace with it. 
Because if you thrash against the pain, it hurts worse. And I think about that when we, we suffer. No one wants to suffer. But I think if we don't come to a place of peace with God about it, and we thrash and we reject and we, we push back and we, we, we whine and cry to God about it, I think it just makes the pain worse. But we surrender and say, God, this is what I'm doing. And that's what this church did. They surrendered to the suffering that they were experiencing. And, and as he said, since you have kept my command to endure patiently. So they were told to do this. And so they took the brunt and they trusted God through it. And when you think about it, when we surrender to the will of God, and we allow God to work in our life through that pain, God gets the glory. You know, Satan wants to defeat us with pain, but when we surrender to God and he takes us and walks us through that, he, he becomes, uh, he gets the glory. And, you know, there's also a purifying that occurs when we, uh, during times of suffering, and as we draw to God, we become more aware of our failings, we become more aware of our excess baggage, and as we clean out our souls, we can be more, see more clearly the sustaining power of God, and that fellowship with God deepens, and it becomes a sweet relationship in the midst of trial. And I can even say in my own life, the times that I have felt closest to God is when I've surrendered in the midst of suffering to the peace of God and the comfort of God, despite the pain that's coming at me from all different directions. Also, the Greek word here, you, since you have kept, the Greek word here, have kept, means to guard his command. So when I hear the word guard, I'm thinking this is in line with spiritual warfare. Paul brings this out in the Ephesians, Ephesians 6.13, Therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. So these Philadelphians were experiencing something tough and they put on their armor and they stood their ground. Sometimes we don't know what to do but as we stand and, and accept that command to endure patiently, we put on that armor and we stand tall and we say, "This is I've taken this ground for God. Jesus, I belong to Jesus, and Satan's not going to have it. When we stand and take that, you know, we stand tall and we give glory to God. This church was obedient to God and stood in the face of battle. And since they had been faithful to God, and not denied his name, despite those lying against them, God will keep them from the dark hour or trial. Now, we don't know what this trial was, but apparently it was widespread. There is also another consideration that God keeps his children safe during the storm, just like he did Noah and his family. Think about it. Noah was obedient to God when he called him to make the ark. It didn't seem necessary. People made fun of him. It had never rained before. But he built the ark, and he was obedient to God. And in time of widespread calamity, they were safe. They were in this storm, but sheltered from it. Think about it. He, they were in the storm, but sheltered of it. So the thing you have to keep in mind, we can't shape how, we, how God is going to protect us. We just trust that God will. God used the ark for Noah. We don't know exactly what he did for these people, but we, knew, we know that he protected them. Verse 11, 12, and 13. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on them, also write on them, my new name, Jesus' new name. Now, we don't know what that is. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
I am coming soon. Now, we obviously know that Jesus, when he said this, coming soon, he's still not here, but he did tell these people he was coming soon. Some may think that this means the second coming, and it could. We also know that Jesus will return, but Jesus is coming to this church to take care of them. He encourages them to hold on with what they have. What they've been doing in their fellowship with God and each other is working. Keep doing it. Their reward is a crown. Now, this crown is not a crown of dominion or kingship. This is a victor's crown. And that makes perfect sense when we start talking about spiritual warfare. This is a victor's crown that a person receives when they win a race, which was a very common practice back then. You know, people wore laurels and it was a victor's crown. And if you won first place, you get that crown. This is not... They have had a crown, and, and he talks about, so that no one will take your crown. So they have this crown, and they shouldn't let the cares, the outside interference of life, remove the crown. This is not the time to take a rest on the sidelines. You know, we hear about the story of the tortoise and the hare, and the rabbit got way ahead, and it took a nap, and then the tortoise beat him. Okay, we don't, we, we're really truly in this time, we don't rest on our laurels being our crowns uh, we need to guard our relationship with god as we would a bag of gold in a busy busy marketplace we have this treasure with god and i like that illustration we must treasure our relationship with god as we would uh, a, a bag of gold in a busy marketplace and this isn't talking about that we don't want to share our faith with others that's not saying that but we can't sacrifice our own personal relationship with God no matter what the cost is. We have a crown. He's promised us this crown. It's a victor's crown. After we've done everything to stand, we will have that crown. Then we're talking about the pillars. Uh, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. One com commentator said this about the pillars. In one sense, there shall be no temple in the heavenly city because there will be no distinction between sacred and secular. For all things and all persons shall be holy to the Lord. The, sh the city shall be one great temple in which the saints shall not, merely, uh, shall not be merely stones as the spiritual temple now on earth, but all eminent as pillars, immo immovably firm, Unlike the Philadelphia city, which was so often shaken by earthquakes. So here we, once again, it helps us to understand a little bit about the history of the community. This area was frequently shaken by earthquakes that buildings were either destroyed or damaged. Because of this, these people may have never viewed a permanent dwelling place as normal. Imagine just how much work this would be for these people and how encouraging it would be here that you will have a permanent place in the city of God, the New Jerusalem. And then it starts talking names. Uh, and as I read through the list, the name of God, the name of God's city, which is the New Jerusalem. And if you, Jerusalem means the city of peace. And Christ's new name, which we don't know. Back then, the pillars of buildings had inscriptions on them. Today we go in and when buildings are dedicated, we put names on, we put cornerstones, we do all that today but back then the pillars of the buildings had inscriptions on them you know the builders the noted leaders the financial backers uh and it was an oppressive thing to have your name on a pillar because if you think about it it was no small feat to have someone's name chiseled on a pillar because it took you know they didn't have automatic machines back then they had a person that had to chisel in and of course they obviously probably had to know how to spell um so it was pretty impressive to get your name on a pillar. But as I looked at it, when we look up the name, and the, it, it, it almost reads like our address today. Um, you know, we have this name, this address, and if I'm going to get a piece of mail, I have to have several things on it. I have to have a city, a state, a zip code, an address, a name. And if I don't have all of that on there, I can't, I can't get that letter to where it's supposed to go. But God is relaying everything here that we need to do to get to heaven. We're going to have the name of God, the name of the city, and Jesus' new name. And so how do we do that? 
We take that upon us when we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. It's not through us, it's through God working through us, and we accept that salvation. And so we will have a new name. We will bear the name of Christ. We will bear the name of God. We will have a new city, and we will have that new address forever. We don't have to move again. We don't have to pack it up. We don't, it's not going to be destroyed. We're not going to be buffered by sin or tears or anything more. I will never have to change anything ever again. And so once we arrive in New Jerusalem, we won't be subject to the shifting scenes of this world. And as these people in Philadelphia experience that ha havoc in their personal lives and in their church, as they, the, the, the synagogue of Satan, plus all the tumultuous earthquakes and things like that, they will enjoy this glorious place, glorious peace in the new Jerusalem and the new city of peace. And I find that rather compelling. I, I, I could have just done so much more with this, I think, as I did it, but I just run out of time. But as we go through look and think, do I see myself in this? Do I see our church in this? What is, what is God speaking to, to me personally? What is he saying to our church, and how do we navigate through that? But I find that all these things are very encouraging, that if we hold true, we endure patiently, and we're faithful to God. He will bless us in ways that we won't even begin to understand, but we will be blessed with that assurance that God is with us. So next week, we will be talking about the church in Laodicea. I'm sure I'll mention the word lukewarm a couple of times, um, but hopefully I can bring some new insight to that. Now is our time for prayer, and... Um, most of our prayer requests are uh, pretty much the same. I do want, we have a, a, one of our Bible study attendees, Sharon, who comes quite regularly on Wednesday night, who has been in the hospital for a couple of weeks and having some severe issues. They're not quite sure what's going on and some dehydration and some uh, can't keep fluids down. But we need to pray for her. Um, very faithful uh, loves Christ, and we just need to make sure that she is, uh, the, the doctors can figure out what what's wrong with her and treat her appropriately. Um, does anybody here have any other prayer requests? Sterling? So Bob had some tests. Right, Bob Spears had some tests, so we need to pray about that. Bob Smith? Okay, so Bob Smith had a, a massive heart attack this morning. And he doesn't have a lot of family or anything like that. Okay. Kind of a lot of a family that got sick. Okay. So he had a lot of family. Okay, so he doesn't have a lot of family, so we need to just lift him up. I know. Right. We just got some lot going on with Bob Smith. Okay, Carol not having pain and issues with her hip.
Well, that's good. Bonnie just said that the Lord delivered her this week, and she used this Psalms 50, 15, that when you call upon me in the time of trouble, I will deliver you. So I will vocalize that praise for those at home that we should give glory and honor to God when he does answer prayer and and uh, when and, and that is very important any other prayer requests okay let's go to the Lord in prayer father in heaven we thank you so much that we can come to you that we praise you for being God that you know our needs before we get there, but Lord, this is a relationship, and Lord, as we come before you in your throne room, you are glorified. You're glorified by our relationship, the fact that we come before you, that our, you are our Heavenly Father, and that you want to hear our needs. So we praise you, God, that you have healed many people, that you've touched many homes, that you have given rest to the weary, that you have provided financially for people. And, Lord, that you're giving us wisdom and discernment to navigate through each and every day. We praise you for your son who came, who lived, set an example, died, rose again, and sits at your right hand to intercede for us. Lord, we praise you that we have that relationship with you because that debt of sin has been paid. And, Lord, it is a free gift. And we praise you, God, that we don't deserve this, but your mercy and grace gives it to us willingly because you love us. We just thank you so much for the love that you have for us. We just praise you because this love fills our hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would bathe our church and every person with that love. And Lord, may that love just fill us and move through us. I praise you, God, that you would touch others through us. I pray that you would help each and every one of us to get out of the way to get out of the way and let you mold and shape us into the shining star that you created us to be, to be that reflection, that, that conduit for your love and your, your holiness to work through us, to give glory to you. Lord, we know that this is a struggle and there's a world out there that is hurting. And, and, and Lord, we know that Satan steals, kills, and destroys, and we pray against the works of evil, Lord, that will make us to stumble and cause us to hurt and cause us to fail. And, Lord, we know that pain comes at us from all different directions and broken relationships and sickness and in financial hardships and lost jobs and loneliness and, Lord, all those things that come our way. But, Lord, we know that as we come to you and rely on you and endure patiently, God, that you receive that glory. And as we, you help us clean up our hearts, that we have that peace and that fellowship, Lord, that as we walk in the light, as you are in the light, we have fellowship with you. And so, Lord, I think about all the people and the needs that are on this prayer request list. And, Lord, there's a lot of them. There are a lot of people that are hurting uh, physically. There's people that are hurting mentally and emotionally. And, 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 Lord, we pray that you would touch and anoint every one of those needs. And so, Lord, we specifically lift up, lift up Sharon, who is having, really struggling with a real health issue. Lord, we bless her for her faithful here. But, Lord, I pray that you would give her comfort to her body and her mind and her spirit. Lord, we pray that you would just touch and heal her body right now in the name of Jesus. And we pray, God, that you would be with the doctors to give her a course of treatment, Lord, that would bring her back to health. Lord, we pray for this Bob Smith who had a massive heart attack today who doesn't have a lot of family. We pray, God, that you would encircle him. May your angels guard over and protect him and you bring healing to his body. And we thank you for Sterling being able to be in his life to help him. We pray that you would help this man to get his needs met. Lord, we pray that we praise you for Bonnie and her deliverance and, Lord, her reliance upon the word of God. And we just praise you, God, because you said that call on you in the time of trouble and you will save us. And, Lord, we defeat the forces of evil, Lord, in the name of Jesus, because we rely on your word. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that we can go and buy. We can have multiple Bibles, but, Lord, I pray that you would put your word of God in our heart in such a powerful way, God, that in the moment of need that we will be able to recite verses, we will be able to pray those words, and we will push back on the forces of evil in the name of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, I pray the blessing of your word upon our church, upon our pastors, upon our parishioners upon our givers upon our children lord that you would put that word of god there then that hedge of protection around our church and lord your word tells us 
that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the work that you have for Galesburg Nazarene and everything that we do in this community, Lord. You have set an open door for us, and Lord, you you made that open door through the blood of your body and your resurrection. And I praise you, God, as we go forward, that we step boldly through that door, that opportunity that you have for us, that obedience that you give to us. Lord, it is you who is working into us to bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, I just praise you. I praise you for the souls that we're going to win, for the people that are going to be healed. I praise you, Lord, that you're going to bring good leadership. We're going to have people that are going to come to Sunday school classes. We're going to have Bible study leaders. Lord, we praise you for all the things that you're going to do in our church that you're providing for us financially. We praise you, God, that you are meeting our needs in very mighty ways. And Lord, I pray that we would take time each day to glorify and honor you. And so, Lord, I lift up all these people who have these health issues. Lord, I think of Carol Knott, who is having some pain and issues with her hip. Lord, that you will specifically touch and anoint her. Lord, I lift up Monica Mel, who's today, who, who's having surgery soon and a precancerous thing. Lord, that you would touch and calm her spirit. Lord, I pray that you would be with Bob Spears in this test that he's had. Lord, I pray that you would comfort him. And Lord, we lift up all the people in our church, Lord, who have cancer. Some have more serious forms, some more debilitating, but Lord, all of them, it costs money and time and emotional stress. And I pray, Lord, you would encircle and lift up each and every one of them and heal their bodies. And I pray that if any of them don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, Lord, that they would come to know you in Jesus' name. And I pray against evil that would bind and blind them in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would bring those people a conversation the blood of Jesus into their life, and they would accept you. So, Lord, we specifically lift up these people who have cancer. Ed Clapp, Dennis Sprague, Morris Stewart, Sylvia Stone, Todd Clickage, Roseanne, Vicki Banks, Terry Heyman, Bob Spears, Mike Coney, Rose, Stella McDormand, Bill Pettigo, Ann, Ginger, and Pat Taylor, we pray for all of them, Father. We pray that they would receive the healing in their spirit and their mind, Lord, that you have for them, that you would regenerate their spirit and their mind to receive the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and the blessings of that relationship. And, Lord, I pray that you would just enrich their bodies, strengthen their bodies in the time of treatment. But, Lord, we pray that you would just touch and anoint them. And, Lord, we think of all these other people who have health issues, May Varnell, Randy Reed, uh, Benjamin Dragu, Barb Hoxima, Sterling England, Clinton Masters, Joanne Howerton, Bill Stone, Paul Oran, Patty Johnson, and Marsha Duke, uh, Gary Larry Barger, and uh, Fran Newton's brother, Gary Barkman. Lord, all of these people have health issues, and Lord, you love them. You want to take care of them, and I pray that you would open up the door for them to feel you, to feel that comfort and feel that healing, and we praise you for the what they're doing in their life. And, Lord, I pray that you would be with the, the sister uh, of Lisa Strong, Cindy Happ, who has a cancerous brain tumor. Continue to help her. Be with Vicki Gleason's sister-in-law, Cheryl Gleason, who has lung issues. We pray that you be with the sister of Fran Newton, Karen Williams, who's recovering from major surgery. We pray that you be with Roger Roberts, uh, who is affiliated with Bev Roberts, who's having heart tests done in Iowa City. We pray, God, that you would continue to be with Bill Burford, who's having health issues. We also pray that you would be with uh, Laura's friend, Kathy, who's still recovering from surgery. The Gonzalez family, I pray that you would encircle and protect them in their family situations and work through them. We praise you for how you're working in Raleigh and Bonnie's son's Luke's life and their grandson, Daniel, and also their unspoken requests. Continue to nurture and help Katie Hames's mother and their family, as she was diagnosed, uh, Katie's mother was diagnosed with ALS. Continue to be with George Fitzpatrick as he's recovering from a stroke. And Jennifer Brown's, uh, the Spears' daughter, she's still uh, experiencing issues uh, from her accident. Lord, all these needs, and Lord, we know there's so many more. We know that there's so many more that people sometimes feel are too personal, and sometimes those issues are deep. But Lord, we know that you are the great healer. You are the great spiritual, physical, and mental healer, and we praise you, God, for that. We praise you, and we just open up the door for your healing to fall on our church and to all, and all these people. Lord, we praise you that you choose to heal us spiritually, and that gift is for everybody. 
But, Lord, we pray that you would work in these lives and in the lives of our church. Lord, give us safety as we travel. Lord, we thank you for the unique mix of people that you brought, this body of believers, Lord, the beautiful mix of people that you have in our church. Lord, we thank you for their smiles, for their encouragement, for their steadfastness. And I praise you, God, that you are strengthening our hearts in all that we do. We praise you, we glorify you, and we thank you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.